Got to turn on your microphone. Good morning. I, 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 I thought Bob Ware could visit me this morning. It's good to see you guys this morning. Thanks for watching online. Some people will be watching this later in the day and later in the week, but I'm so thankful for all of you who are watching. Rhonda, it's good to see you. And David Spear. Linda, I love this song too. I'm with you. And uh, let me see what else I got here. Uh, I'm really slow today. Debbie, it's good to see you. Good morning to you too. Susan Parker, Susan, who was Susan Hurd, uh, she was one of my college students many years ago, and she's watching from Colorado this morning, the beautiful state of Colorado. Jimmy Ridley, good to see you this morning. Josh, wait, Josh and Mike are watching from the big city. The big city. I don't remember what city they live in. It's about an hour north here. It's, they've got a Chick-fil-A. You know, Chick-fil-A is the definition of big city, although they're not open today. Uh, and so now I've made everybody hungry for Chick-fil-A, and they can do nothing about it. Tina and Melody, it's good to see you. Karen Kaplan, it's good to have you watching. Holly, we love you. Linda, and I'm, I'm guessing your sister might be watching. And uh, anyway, uh, Debbie, it's good to see you this morning. Bob Smith, it is good to not see you this No, I'm just kidding. We love Bob. And Daryl is in my group, and it's great to see you and Phyllis. And there's so many people who have, who have responded, and we're glad to say hi to you this morning and doing a great job. And virtual Bob Ware is here this morning. Bob, you're looking a little thin. Think you need to think you need to eat some more pizza. So today we're going to talk about why we should stay strong in trials. And I'm going to kind of talk about this verse. Uh, it's not in your notes. It's not on the thing. So you'll have to look this up, but we're going to put it on the screen and it is Hebrews 6, 19, and it's kind of the key verse. It kind of wraps this whole idea of what we're going to talk about today together. Hebrews 6, 19 says this, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain, and then it goes on to talk about what Jesus does for us. But I want to focus on this idea today that we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Now, I brought an anchor today. There's a bunch of rope in here. I didn't want to disconnect it. Okay, I couldn't disconnect it, but that's good. So this is a boat anchor. And I don't know if you've ever been out on a boat on a windy day, but if you're out on a boat on a windy day and you want to stop and just sit there, it's hard to do. You gotta, if, you, if you don't have an anchor, you've got to keep starting your engine and going and starting your engine and going. Let me tell you something. Many people, even people who've been Christians for years, one of the mistakes that we can make as Christians is we think that we're going to live the Christian life under our own power. We think we're going to live the Christian life by just, I'm going to do good. I'm going to love Jesus. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to be good. I'm going to make my list of do's and don'ts. I'm going to read my Bible daily. I'm going to have my checklist. And if I do these things, I feel like a good Christian. And if I don't, I'm not. And we're just gunning the engine all the time. And then we wonder why we're tired. And the truth is, when the storms of life come and hit you, you run out of gas. You get to a point where you just can't keep pushing it anymore, and you're exhausted. And let me tell you what to do. Put the anchor down. Instead of trusting in your own will and your own ability and your own power and your own ability to, to do what, listen, put the anchor down. Even in my uh, uh, John boat, or excuse me, in my kayak some days, when I'm out on the water, every once in a while, I want to fish in a certain place. And every once in a while, what will happen is the wind will start blowing, and I don't have an anchor in my, John, in my kayak. Now, David has an anchor in his kayak because he's a smart man. But I don't have an anchor, so what do I do? I look for lily pads. And I have figured out if I take a lily pad and I sit on it, that becomes my anchor. You just need something to attach you. Now, listen. When Joseph went through his trial, he knew who God was. When Joseph went through his trial, he trusted God in every circumstance, in every situation. So what we look at and we read these stories and we think, I would never have survived that. That's true. Unless your anchor's in Christ. Now, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what you're dealing with right now, whether it's emotional or physical. Maybe you're tired of your job. Maybe you hate the job you had. Joseph feels for you. Maybe your brothers betrayed you. Maybe somebody in your life is very hard to forgive. Then it's time to put the anchor down. 
Maybe you've been mistreated. Maybe right now you're going through something and you wish you didn't have to. Maybe it's a physical problem or maybe it's a job loss. It's time to put the anchor down. Quit trying to make yourself happy. You'll start looking like the, it's a small world after all. The truth is sometimes we just have to remember who our anchor is. And instead of trying to find satisfaction in work or our relationship or even in comfort, we love comfort, we love comfort foods. Instead, we say, God, I just need you. And because God is with you, it makes the rest of these points true. Because God is with you, you can be faithful. Now, let me read what Max Lucado says in his book, You'll Get Through This. He says, I'll get through this. It won't be painless. It won't be quick. But God will use this mess for good. I won't be foolish or naive, nor will I despair. With God's help, I know. I'll get through this. Do you ever feel like you, you've had enough? I want to give you a few things about why anchoring yourself in Christ in hard times. Three things why anchoring yourself in Christ during hard times is going to help you. Number one, trustworthy people gain blessings. Now, I want you to listen to this. Genesis 39, 2, two through 6, you've got Joseph being taken away. He's sold into slavery. And listen what the Bible says. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. Time out. Now, this is not prospered like we think of prospered. See, in America, typically when a preacher talks about prosperity, you need prosperity. If you love Jesus, you're going to get... And I actually heard a pastor one time say, if you love Jesus, he's going to give you a good parking spot. If your definition of prosperity is a good parking spot, you have missed the idea of prosperity. Another TV preacher said, if God loves you, he's going to give you a nice car. Let me tell you something. If your definition of prosperity is a nice car that can blow up any day, you have missed the definition of prosperity. Joseph's definition of prosperity, listen, he was prospering, and guess what? He owned nothing. The Bible says Joseph prospered, but this wasn't Joseph's stuff, and guess what? The things that you have aren't your stuff either. It's God's stuff. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Does that sound like prospering in how you define it? But prospering doesn't have to do with the stuff we have. It has to do with God blessing us regardless of the circumstances. So he's a slave, and yet the Bible says he prospered. See, too often we look at our circumstance and we think, I'm successful when my job is going well. I'm successful when my family's going well. I'm successful when everybody treats me right. I'm successful when I'm able to be mad at that person and hold a grudge, you know, because we feel superior. I'm successful when I'm the smartest. I'm successful when I don't fail. No, no. He's successful as a slave, the Bible says. Why? Here's why. Look at the first three four words. Three or four words. The Lord was with Joseph. Can I tell you something today? If you're gonna if you're gonna fall asleep, if you're gonna tune out, if you're gonna fall asleep at your computer or looking on your phone, all of a sudden you just nod off, maybe you're sitting in bed this morning. Here's what I want you to know. God is with you. So hang on to him. When his master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So what happened? Joseph was trustworthy even though he was just a slave God prospered him. Why? In just being faithful. All he was is faithful. Why could he be faithful? Because he trusted God. His anchor was in Christ. He wasn't trying to do things only because he got any gain from it. These were not his things. This was not his money. This was not his stuff. He didn't have any benefit. You ever work for somebody and you feel like, well, I'm just helping the boss. That's exactly how Joseph felt. But his anchor was in his real master, who he knew. He knew that God was the one in charge. And then it says, From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had. So because of Joseph, Potiphar was blessed. I hope at your workplace, because of your blessed, that even your boss will be blessed. But Eric, the, I don't get any gain when my boss is blessed. Welcome to Joseph's life. There were no stock options for Joseph. 
There, there was no bonus. There was no health care. There was no, hey, hey, boss, I deserve a little more. No, no. As he was faithful, what happened? He began to entrust him with other things to do. The blessing of the Lord was on him. And so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph's in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Think about that. Joseph was so good at managing that his boss said, I don't have to worry about anything but eating. That sounds like many Americans today, doesn't it? <laughs> Joseph was so good. And in Genesis chapter 12, you remember that God promised Abraham, hey, Abraham, your descendants are going to be a blessing to other people. And I believe God has carried that over, over so many generations. He's used the Jewish people to be a blessing to other people. And most of us know somebody who's Jewish, a friend of ours who's Jewish, or maybe, maybe somebody who we work with who's, who's been a blessing to us. God promised that way back in Genesis 12. And now here, what's happening with Joseph is he is now being a blessing to others. And by the way, God is blessing him in the middle of terrible circumstances. If you're going through something difficult right now, guess what? You can still be a blessing if your focus is not on your circumstance. Joseph did not focus on the fact that he was a slave. He did not focus on the fact that his, what his brothers did to him. He didn't focus on the things that happened to him. He focused on what God wanted him to do. Why? Because he knew who his true master was and he knew who the anchor was. Jesus tells us not to be worried all through the Luke 12. And then at the end of Luke 12, it says this, be dressed and ready for service. In the Greek, it's the idea of tucking your robe in so you can run and be ready. Uh, uh, it'd be like hiking, hiking your pants up or, or making sure you got your tennis shoes on. And then he says, keep your lamps burning. By the way, normally a servant wouldn't light a lamp until the boss arrived. But Jesus says, no, 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 you act like I'm there. You're ready for me. Like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. We don't have to get ready. It'll be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. He'll have them. Now listen to what this says. He'll have them recline at the table and will come and wait for them. I believe that this is a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in heaven. Because we're going to arrive in heaven. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to sit us down. And then it says that he is going to wait on us. Now that is an amazing thought to think that Jesus is sharing this parable, talking about how he will take care of us and thank us for all we've done. And we all know that we don't deserve it. We're just unworthy servants. And then he says, it'll be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or towards daybreak. My first prayer for us today is, Father, make me trustworthy with what you've given me. Because the truth is, no matter what your circumstance, no matter where you're at, no matter even if right now you are a servant and everything's gone wrong and people have betrayed you and hurt you and your life is difficult, he's given you a trust. Light your lamp on hard days. Hang on to the master on hard days, knowing that he loves you and cares about you and know that you're not doing this for your comfort. You're not doing what you do to please other people. You're doing it because you know who the real master is. Joseph's job wasn't really to please Potiphar. His job was to please his heavenly father. And that's what he always did. That's why we read so much of Genesis about Joseph. Number two, anyone can be faithful when it's easy. Anyone can be faithful when it's easy. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when you do what's right, you get punished. Sometimes you do what's right and you suffer. Sometimes you help somebody and it's painful to you. Sometimes you go out of your way to be a blessing to others. And listen, you, you think, I wish I hadn't done that. Man, I went to help that person and they attacked me. I was nice to that person for years and they betrayed me and hurt me. I had a friend named Dave Busby, who's a great Christian speaker, and he used to say, welcome to the cross. 
So often we're surprised when things don't go well. And here's the deal. When the storms come and life is overwhelming, there's only so much power that you have. And can I tell you that if you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing that engine and turning on that engine and going over that big wave, after a while, you're just going to run out of gas and you're going to get burned out. You're going to get exhausted. You're going to find that the joy of the Christian life is gone. You're not going to feel like doing anything. You're going to say, well, I don't want to help anybody or be a blessing to anybody. I'm a slave. I'm here in prison. I was sold by my brothers. Don't you understand what happened to me? Oh, you can't say any of those things, can you? But Joseph could. And the storm came. Here Joseph took over Potiphar's house. He became so trustworthy that Potiphar said, well, what am I going to eat today? But Joseph was good looking. And Joseph was a nice guy. And Potiphar's wife came after Joseph. And because of that, what happened next in verse 20? Anyone could be faithful when it's easy. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. The place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, he got bitter and angry and gave up on God. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not sure favor in the eyes of a prison warden would seem like much of a blessing in the middle of those difficult circumstances. But Joseph was not focused on his circumstances once again. He was focused on God's blessing. What are you focused on in the middle of your prison, in the middle of your trial, in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of your difficulty? So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those he held in the prison. By the way, what was God doing? He was preparing him for leadership. He was getting Joseph ready. He was saying, Joseph, I got things for you to do, so I'm going to prepare you even as you go through the storm. So the warden put Joseph in charge, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Why? Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in all he did. Notice, Joseph is not focused on what his brothers did. Joseph is not focused on what Potiphar's wife did. Joseph didn't go through prison day after day going, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. Now he tells the guys at the end of the, near the end of the story, hey, by the way, I didn't do what I was accused of. So he wasn't denying what happened to him, but he didn't focus on it. Why? Because his anchor was in God. When he grew exhausted and he grew tired, he knew where his focus was. Listen, sometimes in the middle of your struggle, <clears throat> it's a good idea to take some time. Take some extra time. I hope you spend time every day in God's Word. I hope every day you have at least one verse. You don't have to try to read through the whole Bible all the time. It's a great exercise to do. But can I be honest with you? There's times that you just need to take one verse. Maybe you take it for the whole week. And you write it out, and all week you focus on that verse, and you say, God, may I be anchored in you. If you're struggling with anxiety, maybe you take the verse, cast all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. Just, just one little piece of scripture to say, God, remind me today. And instead of focusing on your problem, you focus on God's blessing like Joseph did. So many times, we're waiting for the big break. We're waiting for everything to go better. You know, Eric, when things go better, I'll help in the nursery. <clears throat> I've, I've been a pastor long enough to know how this works. Uh, I've been a pastor almost 30 years now, in some capacity. And over those 30 years, here's what I've gotten. Let me just tell you how it works. So when somebody's in their 20s, they say, Eric, I would help in the nursery, but you know, I haven't had kids yet. I don't really know what I'm doing. And then they have, get married and they have kids. And then they say, Eric, I would help in the nursery, but I'm so tired of helping with kids. I've been, I've been with them all week and I just need a break. Sunday's my day of break. And then their kids grow up and go to college and they say, Eric, I would help in the nursery, but every once in a while my child comes home on the weekend and I don't want to have to miss my time with them, so I don't help in the nursery anymore. And then as they get older, they say, Eric, I've already done my time with kids. I don't work in the nursery anymore. That's how we spend our whole lives and Joseph didn't do that. He didn't say, I'm going to wait till everything's going well to do and be obedient in the moment. I'm going to trust in the anchor that is Christ, and I'm going to do what he's called me to do in the moment. It happens at our church, and it's happened at every church I've been at. As somebody comes to me and says, Eric, I want to speak. I want to be the speaker in church. I want to be on staff here. I want to do this. I want to do that. And I remember Rodney came to me one time, and he said, Eric, I, I, I would just love to be a part here. <clears throat> 
and, and he was in my seminary class. And I said, well, Rodney, you want to do something? Why don't you, why don't you uh, start helping uh, uh, with setting up chairs? And Rodney started helping with setting up chairs. And then I said, Rodney, why don't you lead a Bible study? And Rodney started a Bible study in his house. And I saw that Rodney was faithful with all those things. And then I said, Rodney, why don't you share in church? Because too often people will call me or send me an email and say, Eric, I want to speak in church. And then I'll say to them, hey, why don't you lead a Bible study? Oh, no, that's not really my thing. Eric, where, uh, Eric, I want to speak in church. And I say, oh, great, why don't you come in the morning and help set up food? Oh, that's not really my thing. You notice that Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He was faithful with the little things. You don't trust somebody with something big until you see that they're faithful with something small. I never put somebody in charge of something big like speaking to the whole church until I see that they're faithful with a few things. And Pastor Rodney has been faithful from the beginning with little things. That's why I trust him now with big things. In Luke 12, Jesus said it this way, but understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour where you do not expect him. We're so busy sometimes that we don't take time to be ready. When you read the story that Jesus is talking about, it's little things. It's lighting candles. It's just being ready. Are we ready? Have we spent special time with Christ? See, not only should you have a daily quiet time, you need some time sometimes just to walk away and maybe take a praise walk. Maybe just thanking God for what he's done in your life. Instead of focusing on that problem that you're focused on, to take a drive or take a walk and just be thankful for what's around you and it'll refocus your mind from focusing on your problems which seem like big storms, which seem like big waves and it anchors you back in the rock that is Christ. Father, give me strength to be faithful always. Number three, so not only trustworthy people gain blessings, not only can anyone be faithful and it's easy. Number three, rewards don't always come in this life. I would love to tell you that when you do what God wants you to, that tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll just be blessed. You know, the Bible says you plant a harvest and you reap what you sow. By the way, some of us are praying that God would kill all those weeds we planted in high school and college. We're praying for Roundup for all those things we planted back then. But the truth is, when you're faithful, God does spring up a harvest, but it's not always in this life. My great-grandmother, every house, she never owned a house. But every house she would live in all through Georgia, she would go and plant two pecan trees. And I am sure that right now there is somebody eating pecans that are falling on the ground in their backyard or front yard. Because about a hundred years ago, my great-grandmother planted two almond trees, two, excuse me, two pecan trees in their yards. And one day my aunt said, she said, why are you planting those? You don't stay at a house long enough to ever reap the benefits. The, the plant starts growing and you leave. She said, yes, but somebody will. In life, we need to have that idea that when we're faithful to God, that somebody will reap the blessing. In Luke 12, Peter talks about the parable, the end of this parable. He says, Lord, are you telling this parable to us about the servants or to everyone? The Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager who the Lord, who the master puts in charge of his servants to give them the food allowance at the proper time? By the way, do you see the tie-in to Joseph from the story? The guy who ended up giving the food allowance to his brothers? The guy who, the only thing that they had to worry about in jail, he got put in charge of everything. So he says, who is that? It'll be good for that servant who the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell him, tell you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. Jesus is saying that even if in this world you're not rewarded for hanging on to him and doing what he's called you to do, that one day he will reward you. And this is what it'll look like from the parable of the talents, Matthew 25. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. And then listen to this. Come and share in your master's happiness. Let me tell you something about God's happiness. God's happiness is better than any happiness you've ever had. The most joyful day you've ever had, the happiest you've ever been, the most in love you've ever felt. The most, the most awesome movie you've ever seen, the most joy you've ever gotten from watching a sunset or a sunrise at the beach is just a touch 
of God's happiness. When you get into heaven, the Bible says that he will say, come on, share, not just in your happiness, come share in my happiness. And since God is so full of love and so full of peace and so full of joy, that happiness is beyond anything that you and I can imagine. So our goal as we go through this life, when we look at that verse that says we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure, in Hebrews 6.19, we recognize that when we hang on to that, that one day God will say, well done. Enter into my happiness, happier than you've ever been. And those who've gone before us that have put their hope in Christ and they've attached themselves to Christ right now, they are experiencing that happiness. You can know that those loved ones that have gone ahead of you are experiencing that right now. Here's our final prayer. Father, help me to recognize that even when I'm not rewarded in this life, that you will bless me. And let me tell you something about that blessing. It's bigger than any blessing you've ever thought of. It's more than you've ever deserved. He doesn't reward us because we deserve it, but it's when we trust in Christ. John 3.16 says it very simply, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, that's to put their faith in, that's to trust him. Whoever believes in him, not just knows about him, not just understands him, not just read about him, whoever trusts in him, the Bible says, won't perish but will have eternal life in his master's happiness. We know that. So if you're watching today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love you to send me a note. Maybe today's the day that you say, God, I want to surrender my life to you. I know that Jesus died on a cross and rose again, and I'm a sinner. And I want to turn my sinful life over to you and exchange it for the anchor that is Christ. Knowing that when I put my trust in him, he will hold me close to him. And if you want to do that today, if you'll send me a note, I'd love to talk to you online or even call you. That will be something exciting that we haven't done. Call you, even Zoom. I'll Zoom FaceTime with you or whatever it's called. And, and face-to-face, we can talk about what that means. Because here's the deal. We have to decide what our anchor is, Christians. Is it your work? Is it your satisfaction? Is it everybody being happy with you? Is it pleasure? Is it comfort? Is it your bank account? Is it your health? And instead of making any of those things your anchor, those things are not trustworthy, you say, God, I want to trust in you. And by the way, when the storms of life come, all of those things get swept away anyway. They begin to not matter. So my prayer for you is, Christian, that you'd put your trust completely in him. Joseph was able to go through hard and difficult times. Why? Because he knew the anchor. He knew who God was. And he was able to be faithful always in the middle of great difficulty. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thank you so much that you're our anchor. Father, thank you so much that as we love you, as we spend time with you, Lord, that the things of earth, all the things that we put trust in, when they fade away, we realize that we begin to find our happiness in you. And Lord, even just a touch of heaven becomes ours. Lord, those moments when we sit on the beach and we see the beauty you've created. And Lord, we look at the stars in the sky and we realize how infinite is your power, Father, that we just begin to realize how small we are and how great you are. But Lord, we can thank you for being anchored to you. You're our hope. Lord, we hope in you when the world doesn't seem stable, we know that you're the one who's stable. When our lives are unstable, that we can trust you. Lord, just as Joseph did when he was thrown into prison and taken away. Father, we can trust you. Thank you that you're with us. Lord, I pray for those watching from home that today, as they spend time with you, that just as you prospered Joseph, you would prosper them. Lord, may that start in our spirit, being full of joy and peace. Lord, patience and kindness. All the gifts of the spirit would be ours as we focus and hope in you. Thank you for these moments, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.